Guys, can you imagine life without Medusa? She is truly one of the coolest animals on Earth. Yeah, I mean, I can't think of anything better than teaching people how misunderstood snakes are. And red tail boas are such chill snakes. Unless you're a rat, then you're in trouble. Hey guys, you didn't tell me that you were bringing Medusa out for some sunshine. You know I love her. Why didn't you let me know so I could help? Maybe because she's mad at you because you went on a vacation to a place that doesn't have snakes. You must mean the vacation I went on to the Hawaiian island of Maui. Mm, how boring must Maui be if there are no snakes there? Boring? Maui has some of the most amazing wildlife on the planet, and that's partly because there are no large introduced predators like snakes. Whatever. I see what's going on here. Your dad used to live on the big island of Hawaii when he was younger, and he's just jealous that he didn't come on my trip to Maui with me. No. Should have been me on that trip. Yeah, all right. Well, so Amelia and Sandra, do you guys want to learn why Maui and Hawaii has some of the most amazing ecosystems on the planet, despite the fact that there are no large snakes there? Mm, I don't know, Jed. While you were in Maui, we went on a pretty amazing vacation of our own. You must mean the vacation you guys took to Puerto Penasco in Mexico uh, while I was gone. Mm -hmm. And I bet all the ocean life we saw there blew anything you saw out of the water. Well, we'll see about that. Do you guys want a sneak peek at one of the most amazing animals that I saw while scuba diving in Maui? I guess. Uh, Dad, if this is a competition, we might be in trouble. No, we're not. Bigger isn't always better. But sometimes it is. I guess the only way to truly find out is to show all of you at home the footage and let you decide yourself. We'll start in episode one with all the land animals that I found in Maui, moving to episode two to see all the tide pools you guys saw in Puerto Penasco, coming back in episode three, going beneath the surface of the clear blue waters of Maui. Well, that's not fair. You get two episodes and we only get one? Who said life was fair? I don't know, Jed. Your stuff had better be good, because uh, we're coming for you. Oh, it's good. To understand the wildlife of Maui, you first have to understand the land. Maui is part of an archipelago, or island chain, made up of eight major islands. The chain formed when the Pacific Plate, the largest tectonic plate on Earth, moved over a stationary hotspot at a rate of just under three inches per year. Active volcanoes broke the surface, then grew less active and began to erode as they slowly left the hot spot behind. The oldest of the major islands, Kauai, is four to five million years old. The youngest, Hawaii, also known as the Big Island, is between 400,000 and 800,000 years old. Maui is also young, aged at just over one million years. While the Big Island is famous for active volcanoes like Kilauea, which has erupted nonstop since 1983, Many are surprised to learn that Maui has a volcano that hasn't been declared extinct. Rising over 10,000 feet above sea level, Haleakala lords over Maui. Scientists think it may rumble to life again sometime in the future, but for now, it remains dormant. Since Haleakala's last lava flow in 1790, the entire island has been in a state of decay. Wind, rain, groundwater, and even ice and snow work to break down nutrient-rich volcanic rock into some of the most fertile soil on Earth. In this soil, plants took root and proliferated. No place is this most evident than on Maui's famous road to Hana, a 64-mile wonder of hairpin turns and tropical scenery including dense forests, waterfalls, and beaches. Along the way, you'll find Twin Falls, a place where both tourists and locals can enjoy this unique tropical paradise. Jed, I jumped off that cliff. I remember it like it was yesterday. And of course, you did it 30 years later. Well, yeah, I mean, we're on the road to Hana. We're at Twin Falls. It was absolutely amazing. Now, if you are gonna do any cliff jumping, do make sure other people are there, not only tourists, but also locals. You don't wanna be going into private property or jumping into sacred pools. That's gonna get you into trouble. Really good advice. A lot of the sacred land is on private property. Dad, you lived in Hawaii. With the islands being so young, doesn't that mean the ancestors of every animal that lives there had to come from someplace else? It does. Before humans arrived on the islands about 1,600 years ago, it was an ecosystem dominated by birds and insects, which makes sense given that those animals are uniquely equipped to reach new land masses that are thousands of miles from any mainland. Since humans, Hawaii's delicate ecosystems have been transformed by introduced and invasive no. species that proliferated in a welcoming environment that was food rich and free of large predators. 
Clint, there's no doubt that Maui has a very unique ecosystem. And we were really able to see that when we visited one of my wife's friends, Saul and Hildy's organic farm to learn their entire process. One of the foundations of organic farming is taking advantage of the native insects and pollinators that belong on the islands. Unfortunately, those insects are under attack by invasive reptiles. And we were able to find one of those invasive reptiles, which is the Jackson's chameleon. All right, Critter fans, well, we found a really cool animal here at the Alcoa farm, and we found a Jackson's chameleon. And it is an amazing little animal hiding up in a mango tree. Now this is an invasive species here to Maui. It was introduced in 1972, it's an African species, but unfortunately it has become an injurious wildlife here and can cause a lot of problems because it eats insects. So it's gonna eat a lot of the bugs and a lot of the spiders that are native to this area. Unfortunately, there is a lot of them here, so they can become a big problem. But what an amazing animal. And this is a male, so if we can get up close here, you can see that it's a male because it has the horns. The females do not have the horns, so that's how you can tell the difference between the boys and the girls. So you can see that they have these great claws that they use to grip onto the trees, and they also have a prehensile tail. So they'll hang on with those claws and that tail. And what's great about them is they can change colors like all the chameleons. These guys change from a light brown to a yellowish and then to this green depending on what color they are sitting on. And unfortunately an invasive species, but this is his home, so we're gonna let him go. Uh, it is illegal to bring these animals in uh, or onto the island. There can be pretty big fines. All right guys, so we're back at the mango tree here. We're gonna let this little Jackson's chameleon go. What an awesome find here. I'm gonna put him back up in this tree. You can see how he grips a hold and holds on to those branches there. And Jed, it isn't just at the pollination phase that these farms are under attack. There are also invasive mammals that threaten the crop yield. Yeah, Saul was actually able to show us a herd of axis deer that live in the area, and he does say that they come into the farm quite a bit and eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. In 1867, axis deer were brought to Hawaii as a gift to King Kamehameha V from the people of Hong Kong. Today, it's estimated that 30 to 50,000 axis deer live on the island of Maui. Clint, even though there are all these axis deer on the island of Maui, it seems like they've uh, learned to live with them. And uh, Saul's okay with some of them coming in and eating some of the fruits and vegetables. And in return, he will hunt a few of them for food. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest reasons why the Hawaiian government has decided to manage the deer herd rather than eradicate it. Going to the organic farm was truly a high point of our trip. We got to see uh, free range chickens and goats and all the fruits and vegetables that Saul is growing. And he will use those to sell to supermarkets, to individual families and to farmers markets. Yeah, and farmers markets are one of the best ways that you can learn a little bit about a Hawaiian culture and support the local economy. This farmer's market had an abundance of food and locally sourced products. One of the booths was set up to be able to help local Hawaiian children. Kimokeo Foundation is a nonprofit organization here on Maui that is our mission is to preserve and perpetuate the Hawaiian culture and language. And so our main project that we're working on now is supporting a Hawaiian immersion. And Jed, speaking about Hawaiian culture, there's really no better place to learn about it than one of Hawaii's many state parks. And we were able to visit Iwa Needle State Park, which has a lot of historical significance to the Hawaiian people. Iwa Needle State Park is defined by its 1,200-foot erosional peak. Several historical battles took place at Iwa Needle, making the land sacred to the people of Maui. 
So if you do visit Iwa Needle, just make sure to be respectful. There's a lot of ancestral burial grounds there, but it's a great place to see the local flora and fauna. Chad, it's obvious that you and your family had a great time on your Hawaiian vacation in Maui. And I'm not in the least bit jealous. I'm really happy for you. We truly did have a great time. I mean, it was life changing. And I know for you who spent a year of your life on the big island and for at least a week on all the other major islands, you're very passionate about how to be a good tourist when visiting Hawaii. Oh, I totally am. Folks, the Hawaiian people are rightfully proud of their culture, their land, and their wildlife. If you go there thinking that the money you spend puts you above the laws of their culture, then it's going to cause friction, even if it's just a dirty look. So how do we avoid that? Well, first of all, don't try and sneak a snake on the plane with you when you go to Maui or any other Hawaiian island. This is Thor, by the way. It's too many takes to get by with just one snake. Secondly, be respectful. Do a little bit of research before you go so you know little things like not to get too close to a sea turtle or a monk seal, which is one of only two native Hawaiian mammals. Even though, as you can see, seals sometimes make that difficult. Oh, it's so cute! Yeah, it is. And a big thank you to my friend Brian Shoemaker who provided that great monk seal footage. Brian spent that year with me on the Big Island, and he still has family on Kauai, so he visits Hawaii often. Yeah, thanks, Brian. And getting back to respecting Hawaiian culture, booking an all-inclusive resort on Waikiki might be something for you, but just realize that the majority of that money is going to large corporations. It might be better to look at a small bed and breakfast or even a short-term house rental where most of that money stays locally. Yeah, and it's places like that where the owners are often available to answer questions like, what local restaurant can I go to to avoid national chains? Or, Where's a great cultural event taking place that I can take part in? And don't forget to visit an organic farm if you have the chance and go to a farmer's market to purchase your fruits and vegetables there. That's better for you and for your host. Well, girls, are you guys ready to show your footage of Puerto Penasco? <laughs> yeah, as Amelia said, we're coming for you, Jed. I can at least guarantee a tie. Even though the animals that we saw in the tide pools were small, they were still gorgeous. Yeah, I can believe that. But it's going to be up to you guys to decide in the next two episodes who saw the coolest critters, me and Maui or the Elliot and Porto Penasco. Well, we hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you next time here on Critter at TV, where fear becomes wonder and wonder becomes passion. Bye, Bye guys. guys. Bye.